How's it going y'all? Let's take a detailed look at data classes in Python. We're going to look at all the features you can use and why they're really one of my favorite things in Python. So data class in Python helps you create essentially new data types which are lightweight and allow for type checking by your editor or LSP. They allow you to work with structured and typed data in Python and are how you should probably pass data around in Python whenever possible. So let's take a look at why you would use a data class in Python. So data class is imported from the data classes module. Now this is actually a function that wraps a class and adds a bunch of functionality to it useful for storing and passing around related data. For example, here's a user class with a bunch of fields. If I add a data class decorator, we now have a data class. One piece of functionality this has added to my class is that now I can set the values of this data class right as I initialize it. So essentially the data class has automatically added an init method for me, which essentially just does this. Setting the properties of the class for me. Now accessing values is as you would expect. Now I'd say this is way better than say using a dictionary for a similar data structure. This way my editor knows that this field is a string and now I have a bunch of method hints that pop up. Also, if I try to do something incorrect here, say I try to use the strip method on the ID, I'll get a warning that this field is an integer and I can't do that. Whereas if I try the same thing with my dictionary, my editor really has no idea what type this is and can't save me for myself here. An example where we would use data classes is to say we have a Mongo database. Now this returns a dictionary representing a user which matches my query. And anyone who wants to use this function needs to know what possible data this dictionary has. This probably involves looking at the data in the database or other code which calls this function. If instead I unpack this into my user type, the keys of the dictionary will map to the fields of the data class and the values get set. Now I can set my data class type as the return value of this function. This way, anyone using this function just has to look up the definition of this data class and knows exactly what kind of data to expect back. Next, you could also set default values by simply setting the equals operator. Now, if I try to initialize this data without an email field, an empty string is set. Similarly, I could set this field as optional using the optional type and setting the equality to none. Now setting the default using the equal operator only works for immutable values. In other words, data types which can't change once made. Things like strings, integers, and tuples. For mutable values, we use this field type instead of a direct assignment. The default factory keyword is used here, and we use the list function, which will be called to return a new list and set it as default. We have to do this because consider a regular class where we set the default value of a list like this. If I instantiate object one and append a value of one to the list, then instantiate object two and print out the values of the list, I get this back. This is because all objects of this regular class point to the same list in memory. So when one modifies it, they all get updated. This is why data class does not allow you to do this. Instead, it uses the function in the default factory to create a unique list per object. Now the field type can also be used for immutable types as well if you want, where we can set default values like this. Now with the default factory, we can also set a custom function like this as well. which sets the features all to false. Now one drawback of data classes, which is a drawback of Python really, is that these type hints are not enforced. And I can still set this value for ID to a string, for example. Even though I get an error message from my editor, I can still run this code. Something to be careful about. All right, now that we got a main overview of data classes, let's dive in and take a brief look at the source code here to get an overview of how data classes work in more detail. So we can see that the data class is a function. It takes in the class as well as a bunch of parameters. The if statements here are just to support both ways of wrapping your class, like this and like this. So the function that does all the work here is a process class function. So let's take a quick look. This process class function is where we add a bunch of functionality and rules to our class, as well as enable slash disable them depending on the parameters we pass in. For example, here we look for parameters that we set using the field value and replace them with the default value. This way our parameters don't point to this field value, instead they point to the actual default value. Or here we check that every field that we set has a type annotation. So this is a requirement for data classes. We can't set a field without a type hint. 
So the TLDR of all this processing code is that we're adding a bunch of rules and functionality to our class. Up at the top, we have a bunch of parameters which we can pass in. So let's quickly go through each one so you can get a good feel of how we can use all the various features of data classes. First is the init parameter, which is true by default. It's a flag which determines if we want the data class function to add the init method we saw before. If we set false, values can't be passed in at initialization time. We have to do it after. Next, we got the wrapper flag, which is short for representation. This is true by default. Now this controls the creation of another dunder method or double underscore method, similar to the init method. Remember, dunder methods are special types of methods which add special functionality to classes. With the wrapper flag, the data class function will define the dunder wrapper method for the class. This method creates a string representation of the object. This way, if we print out the object, we get a nice representation for debugging. If we set it to false, we get a default representation which gives a less useful printout with the memory address of the object here. You might want to set this to false if you want to make this method yourself to get a custom representation. The equal flag is also on by default. This lets us compare data class objects of the same type. It'll set up the equal dunder method, which will define equality for us using a field by field comparison. Here these two data classes are equal, while these two are not. This is equivalent to writing a function like this. In addition to equality, it may be less useful but still possible is the order parameter. This is false by default. This defines the less than, less than or equal to, greater than or greater than or equal to dunder methods allowing us to compare different data classes like this for example. Here we get a true that object one is less than object two. The comparison works by going in order, comparing one field at a time, returning at the first difference. This inequality is equivalent to a function like this. Next we got frozen which is also false by default. This means that once the values are set for the data class, we can't change them, sort of like an enforced constant. But this now allows us to hash the data class since only immutable objects are hashable. So adding this object to a set with frozen equals false, we get an error, noting that our type is unhashable, setting frozen to true and we run this code no problem, creating a hash set with our object. Alternatively, if we really want to be able to hash our object but not have to freeze it, we can use the unsafe hash parameter, which is false by default. This way we can still add it to a dictionary, but the unsafe safe part comes along if we modify a field. First we get back a true checking if the object is in the dictionary. If we modify a field, now that same object returns a false. Data classes also have a match args param. This matters in Python 3.10 where Python introduced the match statement. Here's an example using a point class. The match keyword is like a switch statement except a bit more powerful. For data classes, it will compare field by field to determine if there's a match. Match args is true by default, meaning that what we did here is okay. If we set it to false, now our cases require keyword arguments. This just forces us to enter data explicitly when using a match statement. Note that we didn't have to do this above where we instantiated our class. If we want to enforce the use of keyword arguments for our class anytime an object is created, we can use the keyword args parameter. This will require us to always pass values by keyword instead of by position. So even up here, we have to set X and Y explicitly. This should help us avoid values being set incorrectly. Now, finally, the slots parameter here is a bit interesting. Some background first. Normally, Python objects have a dunder dictionary attribute, which is a dictionary that maps attribute names to their values. This allows you to add new attributes dynamically, but it also consumes extra memory, as dictionaries require additional space. If we set slots to true, we don't use a dictionary to store values. Instead, the data classes use a fixed size array. Each object has a fixed memory layout where attributes are stored in the order that they were defined. 
and any lookup of values is just done by indexing this array. This is both faster and uses less memory than a dictionary. This is useful if you have a lot of data, you can save a bit of memory. The downside is that we can't add new fields to the class. All right, now you're an expert in data classes. Congratulations, thanks for watching.